uh, let me tell you a little bit about why we are here and who some of the folks that are here uh, to, uh, to assist us. As many of you know, um, on nine months we've been pretty busy. Um, we started down a journey April 1st of last year to sort of not only change Tampa's economic DNA, but particularly in our urban core, um, we set about a path to hopefully transform it and change uh, permanently uh, what this city looks like and, and uh, hopefully in 20 years uh, no one will recognize how far we have come and what this city used to be. And as part of that, one of the first things we did was to impanel um, an Urban Land Institute panel, uh, bringing in experts from all over the country to help us uh, start the plan, start the master plan for our downtown environment, to bring to the table experts in every field of urban planning, land use development, private sector participants, investors, uh, to talk about what Tampa could and should be and to help us start that discussion. They spent a week here. Uh, the final draft is coming out over the next couple weeks, so that should be available for us. Um, but that was only just the beginning. We have also embarked on, with the help of HUD, um, a study of the downtown core and all of the neighborhoods around the downtown core. Because if downtown is the hub, the neighborhoods are the spokes. And the ability to connect the neighborhoods, which we have never done in this city, from Ybor City all the way to North Hyde Park, um, Channel Side, Tampa Heights, the relationship between all of those various uh, functions, how Ybor City fits and how Ybor City connects to North High Park, because ultimately those will be the places where people will live, work, and play and commute to downtown, and we've got to figure out that connectivity down to the granular level. So we are embarking on that. Out of that, I think, will come the long-term plan and the blueprint for how this city will develop over the next 25 years, long after certainly I am here and most of you. Uh, but this is really not for us, this is for our kids. The next step was, and I, I don't know how or why they did it, um, but I was named as a Daniel Rose Fellow. I, I, I would tease the group last night, clearly it was uh, some form of Irish affirmative action. Um, because I certainly didn't deserve it when you look at the list of fellows who have gone through this program before um, and the expertise that uh, some legendary mayors have been a part of this, and I'm very, very thankful to the, the uh, Urban Land Institute, particularly to the Rose family for honoring us. There are four mayors that have been selected this year. Um, we are also allowed to bring three other fellows with us. Uh, you're late. <laughs> it's good to be the mayor, isn't it? <laughs> and I know his pastor, too, so that's even worse. Uh, the fellows that I selected were uh, Bob McDonough, uh, Jim Schimberg, uh, Leroy Moore, Moore, who handles the development for the Housing Authority, uh, who was here on time, I might add. Um, <laughs> because the Housing Authority, as we all know, is going to be a huge participant in the development of our urban core over the next 10 to 15 years. So I thought, and traditionally they have been excluded, if you will, uh, from this process in a meaningful way, but I wanted them at the table from the get-go. And of course, the great Kathy Coyle, um, who has staffed all of this, who has done an amazing job. So Kathy, first of all, thank you for, for the great work that you've done on this. So what the, what the Rose Fellowship does is they will spend a year with us. We've identified an urban challenge for us, an opportunity, and the experts that you will hear from, and they will introduce themselves in their various uh, capacities, have spent the last week looking at this, but more importantly, spent the last six months working with our staff as we have developed uh, not only the challenge, uh, but help them in terms of guidance um, and delivering a product that we will talk about today. The area that we are looking at because it is so critically important to the success of downtown and our urban core, is the area um, North Boulevard Homes, which is obviously under the control of the Tampa Housing Authority, um, and all of the area behind North Boulevard Homes, which is largely owned by public entities. If you can envision this, there are two schools, three schools actually, behind North Boulevard Homes. And then you have a, a piece that Hillsborough County owns, that it's, it's a building that provides some social services, and then the city owns Martin Luther King Recreational Facility and a very, very significant piece of land that we park trucks on. We park trucks on it. I mean, it, it is high, it has great, got great view corridors into the downtown, and it is a block off of the river. And I will tell you, and I've said this from day one, the plan that Ed Taranchek and some of the others put together in advance of the Olympic bid, and then more importantly, uh, from the Civitas project was the right plan. It was the right idea. It was the right scheme to develop the waterfront on the Western Bank. 
Um, and we are building, and Ed is in the audience, has been very helpful in this. We are building significantly on a foundation laid by those who have come before us, and they have done a lot of work. And they were right 10 years ago, um, and our job is to, to get it right this time and move it forward, understanding that the economy is different, there are certain dynamics that are different, but ultimately the underpinnings of that plan was the right plan and we need to move on it. So that's sort of why we are here. This is the third step, and all, out of this, we will compile all of the work that has been taking place over the last six months and will continue to take place as we collect input from the stakeholders um, and, and create that environment and create that plan that will allow us to move forward. And I will tell you unequivocally, 20 years from now, they will say about this moment and this year that this is where we changed Tampa's history. I am convinced of it. Our job is not to put these plans on the shelf. When these folks leave, our job, all of us that are here today, that are investors, that are stakeholders, who have put their personal money behind this and their political capital, our job is to go execute it. That's up to us. But I will tell you, this is where it begins. And 20 years from now is where it will end. And we can all say that we were a part of it. So with that, Hillary, it's yours. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Crenshaw. Um, I'm a real estate developer, president of Sloss Real Estate, an urban redevelopment firm in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm also a faculty member and co-chair this year with Hillary Birch from New York City, <clears throat> who is a great urban planner and architect. Um, we have all enjoyed being in your beautiful city this week. It's an extraordinary city and working with your team, great mayor. First thing I said to the mayor, I said, this is hard work, isn't it? And he said, I love getting up and going to work every day. And he does. So you're lucky to have such a great team in place. All right, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our project. And um, we've been looking at the riverfront, the Hillsborough Riverfront, northwest of downtown, as the mayor mentioned. The Urban Land Institute, <clears throat> excuse me, provides leadership in best land use practices for creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. We are a 30,000 member organization representing the entire spectrum of land use and development disciplines, and we offer a number of fields of expertise to people around the world. Um, this is the Rose Center for Public Leadership, and it was created in 2008 with a generous grant from Daniel Rose. Our mission is to encourage and support excellence in land use decision making by providing public officials with access to information, best practices, and other resources. We provide forums, workshops, webinars, and our flagship program is the Daniel Rose Fellowship. As the mayor said, four cities are selected across the country, and each of the mayors selects three fellows and a team coordinator. The cities that were chosen for the 2011-2012 class are Kansas City, Missouri, Oakland, California, Tampa, and Providence, Rhode Island. We have representatives on this panel this week from each of those cities. This week, our student study visit is where we've assembled a team of experts to address Mayor Buckhorn's concern. Again, the hills for a riverfront area northwest of the downtown. This is a year-long process for your city, and so we're just beginning. We met in Los Angeles earlier this year, we're visiting here, so this is a project that will be going on throughout the year. This is our project, our assignment, how Tampa can transform and revitalize the Hillsborough Riverfront northwest of downtown. We'll start with observations, followed by organizational site principles, housing and redevelopment, early opportunities, implementation, and we'll end with concluding thoughts and some homework for you all, because again, this is a year-long process. The study area assets, um, Mayor Buckhorn is, is leading the process and, under, and is committed to focusing resources um, and investment to bringing activity, activity to the urban core while maintaining the culture of the urban core. Um, the proximity, to the central business district is it's not that far from there, so that, that's an incredible ac asset. Uh, you have nearby educational institutions, a large university, a university annex, as well as a state-of-the-art high school right there on your riverfront. 
um, the nearby cultural facilities. The diversity of the community is a major asset. There's a proven track record with the housing authority. Your housing authority is known not only in Tampa, but throughout the region and the nation. And that's a tremendous benefit. And there's good collaboration between the city and the housing authority, hence Leroy's um, participation as a fellow for Tampa. The opportunities, you have the opportunity for potential large scale immediate redevelopment sites that will become available in the near term. The waterfront and the river can be a bigger regional attractor and an economic development driver to create many opportunities to both bring crowds and, and uh, quite frankly, make money. Um, the public agencies that control the land to col collaborate on a vision that shares resources. So it's an opportunity for those uh, different uh, governmental or entities to build relationships and develop trust amongst each other. And there's the potential to strengthen the neighborhood's urban and social fabric. Uh, this is clearly a neighborhood. It needs to become a community. There needs to be more activity that brings people together so that they can um, start to develop relationships and, um, and a little more cohesive fabric. The challenges with, you know, opportunities come great challenges. and. And the, the first challenge is the social issues and the safety issue, both real and perception. We heard over and over again that there's a perce perception that it's not safe in the area. And once a perception is there, it's difficult to change. So there's going to be have to be some energy and work around changing that perception. Uh, there's a negative perception about the area's identity. In other words, there is isn't one. There's just a bunch of poor people that live there and no one should care about it. So the neighborhood really needs to, the community need, really needs to create an identity. Um, it's it's um, closely coord coordinating. You need to coordinate with other multiple public agencies. And anybody knows when you've got a bunch of governmental agencies that have to work together, it's not easy. So um, the lack of connectivity and access to jobs and resources, buses run until 9 o'clock in the evening during the week and, at, and only until 7 o'clock on the weekend. So it's difficult for the residents in that area to get from work. The first exhortation that we thought that was important was to, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is failing me, is to think big and to be bold. The site, uh, bound as it is and hemmed by 275 and the Hillsborough River, is, is indeed uh, in, in isolation. And, and, and as such, it's a, a hard not to crack, you know, and, and it's a site that, that really can serve um, um, as a hinge, as a gateway, but most of all as, as a glue. Uh, the other one is an enormous resource. Um, one would not know from being within the site that the uh, Hillsborough River is there and that, that this is waterfront. And it's indeed a spine that runs all the way through the city and, uh, and a very strategic asset. And, and it really it would be like a, the strategic uh, a fault line right now, but really more uh, uh, something that could act as a seam to join the two together. And also very important is to uh, continue an open space network that can all uh, bring together the different neighborhoods in the downtown and also bring new offerings uh, within the neighborhood for uh, community boating, uh, places for people to access the river, and even uh, some transportation components. Um, and as one looks at the site uh, and really starts thinking of not just what could happen at the site and how magnificent that one area is, is really thinking of that, again, as the glue that, that permeates out there and starts binding uh, these areas together. And, and that all of those uh, key institutions, uh, cultural uh, uh, schools and all that are really like uh, uh, jewels around the necklace are extended and perhaps that others are built and added to those so that um, the site is, is not really what happens there, but the site really becomes that, that it really binds the city together. And, and, and opens a, a whole realm of new opportunities. Um, looking at it together, uh, we think that the, the, the enormous asset of the open space and the existing parks uh, can be built upon to extend them and bring them to the site and to begin to create a corridor so that uh, other parts of the, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods can access the water 
where maybe new points of uh, recreation and, and public access could be brought into it. Uh, looking at the suns, the, the many constellations of, of institutions uh, such as stars and others that are along, along there that could be bound together, uh, increasing the connectivity to the site and the, their possibility of pedestrian connectivities at key points and, and even through there and improving those connectivities there, but also even thinking of new pedestrian connectivities that could allow uh, the two to come together and create that, that, that uh, uh, network. And then also beginning to look at West Main Street and then uh, at, at those strategic areas looking at, at, at some services of retail. And again, uh, if one then starts looking at the, the areas of inferences of how this all comes together, uh, one sees that there's an enormous opportunity here at the center of this framework, if, if, so to speak, uh, where uh, mixed income, mixed use uh, a neighborhood could develop uh, within that, that again binds all of the pieces together. So uh, in terms of the guiding principles that come from, from this quick overview, uh, one of them is to really to build up on the urban densities of the neighborhood. It is a downtown neighborhood. Uh, it would can be a downtown neighborhood uh, and not uh, continue to develop as a suburban model. Uh, to use the riverfront as a strategic opportunity to promote connectivity uh, between the neighborhoods, uh, to bind them together and, and have them gel. Uh, and then uh, build on mixed use and mixed income, which is um, uh, a project, uh, you know, uh, something that has been done with a great success in other cities that we'll see Chris is uh, showing a, a, a project like that in Denver. And, and also to have to facilitate the, the, the public spaces and all those institutions that are in place uh, really be the catalyst to, uh, to make this happen, uh, the strategic uh, components of that. Uh, Hillary Birch will now uh, detail uh, some of these elements. <clears throat> So, so I think um, Antonio is really trying to look at um, kind of the broader picture, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about a little bit is that we have a site area and a boundary, and I think the point that Antonio is trying to make is that, that that boundary is just a limited site boundary, and really with this site, the location has to be thought of in a much broader way and as its role and what it can do for the entire city. Um, what you see here is a pretty simple diagram. It's, one, it's a 1,200 foot walking distance. We do that often. And what it talks about is the concept of a neighborhood. And right now, this area has suffered from some issues of um, perception in terms of security and what its identity is going to be. And what you really have here and what this place is going to become over the development is it is going to become a neighborhood. And with that, we have to see its adjacencies to the different communities, including the central business uh, district, as well as its, its neighbors to the left and to the right. And this actually actually has a little bit of a challenge here because 275 forms kind of a barrier between the actual site adjacency and the river, while an opportunity, also you know, makes connectivity across to the river, to the community on the other side, a little bit of a challenge. Um, the river is the center. I work on a lot of waterfront projects and I can't say it enough and I think you all recognize it, but the site is incredible. Its location on the riverfront is incredible. So what we're looking at here really is riverfront development. But what, what you also see is, and I think the mayor has talked about it, is the east and the west side. And with the river, you have the chance to expand Tampa from the east to the west. And with that move, you also get the river as the spine. So the river is the place that binds East Tampa and West Tampa and really makes it, you know, twice the place that it is today. Also up and down the river you can see all the places and you've already started to put a framework of significant entities and events along the river. You have um, Rick's which everybody seems to love to go to, um, we've heard a lot about that, um, as well as Blake High School of the Performing Arts which is which is a great amenity for the community. The Riverfront Park, which seems to need a little bit of help, but you know, is great to have an open public space along the waterfront, and the Performing Arts Center all the way along the waterfront. The other thing you can see is these start to be on the east and the west side. So it really is a challenge to try and say, how do you take the river, the connections across the river, and the amenities, and really make it a place that binds the, the project going forward. Um, as I said, I, do, I work on a lot of waterfronts. What we always say is start with the water plan. You know, Baltimore, we reference as the city that really understood the water plan and kind of capitalizing it because if you don't plan for the water's eventual use, then you look at it, you know, behind the curtain. The other thing is, is that um, we try and look at developments and you kind of start from the water. Instead of starting with a land plan, you start with a water plan and that actually can inform a lot as to what you, how you use the land plan. Um, Province, one of our host cities, they do um, water fire. Um, 
which is an event that has really, you know, been a huge opportunity for downtown Providence. And I really, I actually like this picture because you can see all the people standing on the edges. So it really speaks to how many people and how much a center of energy that the water and the river can be for a town, um, one of our own cities this year. Um, I've also included two other pictures on this slide. One is um, the Central Park Boathouse. It's a project that we worked on. And it, it speaks to two things. One, it speaks to boating and the traditions along the river. And two, it also speaks to a small thing and what a big difference it can make um, in the context of a plan. The picture on the top, is, it speaks to the pylons and the authentic effect that these, the, the boating and the river is already operating and kind of starting to inform the identity for your river. And I think that that's something that is, that is authentic and hugely valuable and should be continued and, and celebrated. Um, next is river walks. On the left is Battery Park City, which is, is a huge success in Manhattan. And perhaps it's, it's, it's obviously got more people and it's kind of a different community. But there, they vested in a 60-foot um, esplanade. Um, here on the right, you can see your esplanade is started. And from what I understand, you're looking at a 23-foot easement. From my experience, if you dream 23 feet, that's all you're going to get. 23 feet will enable you to have a walkway. What you really want to do is, is make it a, a public greenway, a public access way, a place on the waterfront. And now with this new site, on the right, on the west side, you have the chance to create and define how the promenade or the riverfront or the walkway will be going forward. So it's a real opportunity. I mean, I would even challenge you to put the roadway along the riverfront. Um, these river walks are about public access to the waterfront. You only get one opportunity to kind of do it right. You have the site kind of set up. Currently on your sites, you have the fences kind of blocking that up. Even just starting to bring the fences and letting people experience the waterfront would be a huge opportunity. Um, lastly, Rick's, um, you know, everyone we talked to talked about dining opportunities on the waterfront. You know, it's going to be a huge draw. So it doesn't have to be big development that, that would bring people to the waterfront. If you bring a few more retail establishments along the waterfront, it will be a huge opportunity. And it's already started on the west side, on the east side. Just put a few more in there. And lastly, I'm gonna, I, I, it's kind of a transition, but we put this in here because we heard a lot about transportation. As, as Bridget mentioned, the bus service is limited and, and challenged. Um, you have a water taxi, but I, I would encourage you that as you go forward, the water taxi can really be not only a, an amenity, but it can be a real resource connecting the downtown to the site area and up and down the river into the waterfront. It, it can be a means of transportation that makes it kind of an exciting way to get people on the river as well as commute between downtown and, and the site area. Um, other things that we would like to talk about is bike paths and bike lanes starting to get in as we start to develop the infrastructure we need to put those in, um, as well as key studies of the corridors. You know, as I said, 275 cuts across. You have gateways into that community. We really need to understand about the access to the site and how to make it more permeable across the site. So with that, I am going to pass it over to Charnel and Matt, and they're going to talk a little bit about the sense of community. <coughs> This community already has a precedent for inviting in new folks. I um, was very impressed with what I've learned about Blake, where every day um, students from different parts of the city and county, folks from different economic, racial, ethnic backgrounds come together um, around a common purpose to uh, really come together and form a community around performing arts, arts and culture. This um, this redevelopment process can provide an opportunity to extend this invitation to include new residents, new businesses, and new, um, new activities and building types here. So um, it's not something that, that hasn't happened here before. One of the anchors um, that I think is going to be important will be uh, the Martin Luther King Center. Um, providing, uh, which could meld with the County Community Service Center, providing state-of-the-art facilities and programs to serve the residents here in this community in West Tampa and um, in other parts in other parts of the region to really strengthen the fabric that's already here. Um, our 
we would recommend um, that you might consider programs that are unique to the center, maybe fencing or, or something that you can't get out elsewhere. Again, to continue to invite people in. Um, the center and the services center might extend beyond its current um, offerings um, and also <coughs> beyond its current boundaries, perhaps even north and, and over to the river, um, offering things that are not currently available and that complement rather than compete with service offerings at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, again, the magnet schools here, the, the middle schools for science, math, and technology invite new people into the community every day and we think that there are opportunities working with business leaders, industry leaders, um, and your CAMELS Center to um, extend this invitation to include technology, education, training, and perhaps even employment opportunities for this community. So with the redevelopment of the public housing community, there's an opportunity to provide a whole new space, a whole new community. <coughs> Um, with uh, the really kind of challenges, preconceptions about where different groups of people belong um, and the types of places that they might live and congregate. So we see that there's potential for an opportunity for high income as well as um, moderate and low income people <laughs> to live here and uh, also to recreate here, and to get to know one another. Uh, we see that by strengthening gateways and having new building types, we'll be able to have a paradigm that's, that's new to the city of Tampa. Um, so it's a great opportunity to, to bring people together. Um, in bringing folks together, we think that um, Main Street could be a start. Um, we talked a little bit about promoting new entrance ways, improving circulation, but by revitalizing Main Street, there are opportunities to bring in new neighborhood serving businesses where people can congregate, where we can promote entrepreneurship, and where folks can just get together and begin to get to know one another. Matt? So part of the redevelopment process is you're changing the physical landscape of a community, but as this process continues and has been said, part of it is also creating a new community identity. So we heard a lot this week about they and those people and them, and we didn't hear a lot of, of we. So the question is, who is going to be the we of from here to the next 20 years, as the mayor pointed out? And we really see the planning process as an opportunity or a catalyst to start this conversation about who is the we, what is the community, what is gonna be your identity? And then that sort of leads to the next question of how do you brand yourself? How do you market this new area? There's a real perception that the area is unsafe and, and underutilized, not the kind of place you want to visit. So what's an immediate strategy that you can use to combat that? Crime fighting. Think about expanding community policing, uh, police patrols, expand the crime watch, use environmental designs to reduce crime opportunities and then tell the story of crime reduction, combat that myth of danger in the community. And then think about how you can leverage tourism dollars to create websites, brochures, marketing materials. So this becomes a draw, it becomes the place you want to go. So what is the new place and how do you market it as a tourist destination or as a neighborhood for people to live, work, and play? Now we're going to invite up Chris Parr from Denver. You guys hanging in there? All right, that's great. Go the right way. How's it going? So you guys are familiar with the neighborhood. You know that this is a concentration of poverty, but one of the great assets Tampa Housing Authority has over 800 units in the neighborhood. Significant other affordable housing that there might be some opportunities with. Um, you know, but with that concentration of poverty, you guys know that that is part of the opportunity also. And also from the standpoint of uh, concentration, it's not just that's the area for low-income housing, but I think from the embracement of, of Tampa for that condition, it needs to be, that's also, also unacceptable. That, wasn't, that didn't come from a great design in 1940, but now's the opportunity to, to directly uh, eliminate that concentration of poverty. The 
and we've talked enough about it, but that river in downtown that this neighborhood needs to be able to, to, to look at the fact that the river obviously is an asset. What does development look like as oriented towards that, uh, toward the river? And I think you've seen a lot of the initial design bringing that, uh, those areas through. And downtown, don't look at downtown as over there, but I think that's part of the vision is downtown expands. This is becoming a downtown neighborhood. Um, very lucky to have a sophisticated housing authority. And I hope everyone here recognizes that. That's very, very important so that they're a significant player at the table uh, from the financing opportunities and the land control uh, aspect. Other specialty housing is some of the other observations of what might be possible. Talk about potentially senior housing, utilizing what's going on with Tampa, University of Tampa. And then I think one of the most important things that take away anything else from what I'm going to talk about is that density conversation. And it's, uh, it's that point of boldness that we talked about earlier in the form of density. So if you're average of 20 to 25 DU currently, it's not a conversation about do we just increase that a little bit, do we go to 40 uh, dwelling units per acre, but this is recognizing what that point of vibrancy is and where that starts to happen. And to just start, even at a platform of 60, but 60 plus from the density uh, conversation, I think is important to, uh, to start. I wanted to look at uh, uh, Denver, not because I want to talk about Denver, I know we're in Tampa, but just to pull from some of the similarities uh, that we've, we've wrestled with over the last several years. We have several uh, developments, uh, complete, complete, underway, and starting uh, in the Denver neighborhood, uh, Denver area, but you can see proximity-wise what we wrestled with was how could these development sites relate to downtown? Because when we started, they were not part of downtown. So that's been that constant struggle to see there's downtown, that is part of us because uh, like Tampa, we want to uh, head the vision to grow the downtown and uh, make these neighborhoods part of that downtown core. And that was 20 blocks away when we started 10 years ago, Curtis Park. Downtown has expanded three blocks beyond that at this point. Uh, quick look at one of our development sites, uh, East Village Park Avenue case study. Again, similar style housing stock, two, three story, very style building, uh, very common throughout the country, the 40s and 50s. And uh, you know, completely isolated. It was that area that nobody went. It wasn't safe, and this is what we heard consistently all week long. That was that area over there. And uh, it was removed from the street grid. People drove around it for the last uh, many years. And I, I can't help, we, we heard a lot about the Olympics, so I'm gonna make everybody feel better. Um, 1976 Winter Olympics, Denver was uh, put a bid in and was awarded the 76 Olympics. And they actually built, uh, issued bonds and built the Olympic Village and then uh, turned down the Olympics. Um, so maybe that will make you feel a little bit better. Um, but so we're left with an empty, an empty Olympic Village. But uh, so you guys are as bad as me. Um, here, is, here is that site today. So we had a park that no one would go into. It took your life in your hands if you went there. Look how close we are to downtown. We had, again, the street grid that was eliminated. And by the time we were done, and again, same conversations, density, coming in and uh, tripling, quadrupling the density, um, putting back the product, enlivening the neighborhood. The community even wanted to put back the connector street uh, through the neighborhood so that we could really connect and have that seamless, that seamless vision. Uh, two of the southern sites that I showed in that initial map I want to look at real quick. Just want to recognize the planning process, dealing with river conditions uh, on the left. But let's look at the one on the right. And again, part of that, uh, part of our wrestling match there, we have a couple things that uh, struck us as very interesting. We have a restaurant, a uh, 120-year-old restaurant, embedded in the middle of our public housing site that we wanted to talk about as an asset. And then we had a uh, college campus uh, right there, again, that had, a, had this mythical boundary that people just simply did not cross. And to the south of it, we had a medical facility that, again, no one wanted to live in this neighborhood that was so close, but there was such a great need for uh, housing for the faculty and the staff at the uh, hospital in close proximity downtown. The conversation really centered around, uh, with the community over the last three to four years, around this two, four, six, eight conversation about the density. I think this is, that, again, that takeaway point is that our early conversation with the neighborhood is take that 1950s barrack style house, and this is all we can handle. That, is, that was the bold vision because it became an issue of uh, product type and what people's comfort level was and what are you going to do to us with this density conversation. But then we flip the conversation. I think that's what Tampa's done a great job in the other sites at the time for. Is talking about well, what do you want? What is the vision for this neighborhood? What's it going to take to attract that attract that kind of investment? At the end of the day, the conversation came to that density, and the neighborhood even at the end they became the champion for that six story, that eight story, recognizing to bring in that mixed in, mixed income, mixed use community 
But that's, what's, that's what it's going to take to attract that private investment and to really make that statement that this is a revitalized, recrafted, redeveloped area. Mm -hmm. And also that restaurant is at the end of this block. And by embracing them, because it was that destination that people were going to go to no matter what, which again, that's, that's the Rick story uh, that we heard, uh, they're now opening uh, they sort of like rattlesnake and all sorts of stuff. It's a little, it's a little crazy, but uh, they're now opening a butcher shop on the main, uh, main uh, level of one of those buildings. Super quick summary, um, that commitment, which is already there, I believe, but just making a very strong commitment with no question that uh, the redevelopment of North Boulevard Homes is something that has to move forward. Uh, mixed income, mixed use is inherently going to go with that. And again, knowing that you're a downtown neighborhood, not a neighborhood near downtown, but you are a downtown neighborhood, and uh, increase the density of traffic investment, as we said, public investment, which you have the opportunity to do because of land that's publicly held, taking that forward to leverage the private investment to attract the market. And then again, actively pursue those partnerships uh, to go for a strategic economy. We wanted to look at some early opportunities that you might embrace right now. Um, the first thing is you got to get people to the site. You have to activate the site and let people see the absolutely incredible potential of the riverfront. It's such a beautiful place. We were all just struck by the wonder of it. And some examples, some ideas for that are programmed farmers markets. Um, we have a farmers market in Birmingham, 10,000 people every Saturday morning that has completely revitalized an abandoned warehouse district. So I have a lot of experience with that. Um, the skull and crew events, there are a lot of people skull and crewing on the river. You've already made connections with universities in the Northeast that come down here in the winter time. But there are other events um, around the country that you all could develop around that skill set. Um, performances in the amphitheater. I know the park's not renovated, but you got an amphitheater. There's students, there's Shakespeare in the park. There are a lot of ideas where you might activate that amphitheater and create reasons for people again to come to the, to the site. Um, and art shows, art shows in the park. There are some community gardens, some plantings being done along the riverfront, but you can always plant more flowers or some vegetables, and it's an easy, quick way to uh, activate and bring people to the site. Um, again, make people go, let them see the river and walk along the river. We were able to walk along the sidewalks of the school. Those areas, I think, are basically fenced off, but you can now easily pull those fences back, opening the existing sidewalks, and let people walk along the area through Blake High School campus and down to the park, and then up to Rick's. I mean, there's a way very quickly you can make that happen, even while you're in the planning process. The Blake campus, which is an arts campus in an amazing, amazing place from everything we've heard, could be enlivened with lighting and landscaping and great graphics and color and signage. That's an easy thing to do. And again, build on the capacity of this Skull and Crew community uh, nationally. I mean, it's a great place to practice. It's a beautiful thing to watch for everyone. And we suggest that you um, explore ways to have a deeper conversation around that skill set. And as Hillary mentioned, promote the water taxi, river tours, um, development of the marina. So those are things we think that you can do fairly quickly. Connectivity is a huge issue, big part of our conversation, because people felt isolated. It's hard to move in and through and about the neighborhood. So start to look at pathways. An immediate opportunity we felt might be reducing the Laurel Street Bridge from four to two lanes. There's some money that we heard is budgeted for improvements on that bridge, and it might be very easy to go ahead and add some bike lanes and some pedestrian pathways so that people can walk um, to and from the neighborhood. And then again, just think about pathways for walking, for bicycling. It just takes a little paint, so that's something you can go on and put in place now early on and, um, and as you continue to develop a, a roadway plan um, throughout the neighborhood. So, um, oh, Blake High School. This is one more. Um, we talked about partnerships, that the opportunity for the school to reach out to other arts organizations, the museum, um, to open up the school for more community uh, partnerships and performances. I think, again, someone mentioned, Hillary mentioned the uh, Stras Performing Arts Center. The, they're ballet students that every day go to school at um, Blake and then go across the river to the Stras Center for the conservatory. So to strengthen that relationship is a great opportunity. And again, to integrate art, it's the Performance Arts Center, enliven the campus with art. 
So I'm going to now turn it over to Charlie, uh, who will talk to you about implementation. Thank you, Kathy. I'm sorry I'm going to croak at you a little bit. I've been breathing hotel air. Um, we've shared with you some ideas uh, that uh, hopefully are useful to you in, in, uh, in looking at this site. But one of the things that's uh, important about uh, good ideas and good ideas that work is work. And so what I'm going to share with you is uh, some of the things that we see need to be accomplished at least over the next 24 months in terms of uh, getting the work done to essentially capitalize on, on the good ideas that hopefully we've shared with you, but also that you're going to be generating yourself uh, as a result of the planning process that's currently underway. First thing is uh, we're suggesting that you uh, form a community redevelopment area district and you get outside the red line. And, uh, and there's lots of reasons for getting outside the red line. One is to uh, capitalize on some of the opportunities for connectivity, connecting to adjacent neighborhoods, but also uh, uh, creating the synergy among the uses in the, in the, in the various neighborhoods, uh, things that Antonio was talking about in terms of uh, a financing mechanism for being able to pay for some of the improvements that are going to be necessary to implement these ideas. Second is, you're going to be in the process of redeveloping uh, the uh, public housing site and uh, uh, allowing tenants to take Section 8 vouchers and uh, uh, go around the city and find where they would like to live. And so uh, hopefully within the next two years you'll have completed that relocation process. And that site will be one of the first opportunity sites that you have available. Uh, the mayor mentioned the uh, uh, wastewater vehicle storage yard. Um, that also is a near-term opportunity uh, for, uh, uh, for, the, for the area. And so recognizing that that relocation, uh, depending upon what the costs are and uh, the location, the landing spot uh, is, um, that is also a, a near-term opportunity within the next 24 months. Um, Infrastructure and, and transportation funding, uh, you know, infrastructure is old, 70 years old. Is it sized right? Maybe the water system is fine, but uh, roads, uh, pedestrian uh, access, uh, sewer, uh, all those things having to do with infrastructure and transportation needs to be analyzed, understood, priced, and, and so that you recognize that you're going to go out and find the money to get those infrastructure needs met. Uh, I wanna, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the community vision and land plan component of, of the greater downtown master planning process that you've got underway, but hopefully that process can be done uh, within 24 months. In California, where I'm from, it would take us, I wanna, I wanna, I'm not kidding, five years to do something like this. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, you have the ability to move a little bit faster than we do in California. Uh, and then finally, because the, uh, because the property is divided among public agencies, all of whom have their own silos, um, it's important that uh, under the mayor's leadership and uh, with the involvement of all the uh, principal property owners, that there be agreement among those sovereign public agencies about implementation and how things are going to happen among those agencies. Let me talk about the community uh, vision uh, land use plan. I, I work with a lot of land use plans and, and I want to tell you the first principle is make sure all the stakeholders are involved. Why? Because the plan has to be owned by the people that are going to be affected by it. So involvement creates ownership. Catalyze. Look for catalyt catalytic uh, uses. Now this is a great location. Does anybody want to go there? They're going to want to go there as a result of the kinds of uses that are planned to be there. And so the, the kinds of catalytic uses that the, that the master planning process identifies that would cause this to turn from a nice location to a great place are going to be really important. 
uh, map the uses. The development of this area is going to be phased necessarily because the properties that are available for development are going are not going to all be available all at once. Uh, you've got school district property, you've got privately owned apartments, you've got uh, the public uh, housing uh, property, you've got the city's uh, vehicle yard. And so <clears throat> make sure that you, as you phase the development, that you know where you want to put things on those phased opportunities uh, for development. The financial analysis I see a lot of master plans to the extent that the, the master plan does not understand what the capital costs of the, of the public facilities are going to be, and also the economic vi viability of the private investment, they will fail. So that component is really, really important. Density. Density creates scale. Scale creates place, a place where where you then have a community that is a large enough scale to be able to support the services that that that, that community is going to want to consume uh, if they if people want to live there. So scale, services, retail are all sort of intertwined in terms of creating a great place. We talked about connectivity, uh, the barriers that exist in terms of access to the site, in terms of the freeway. Uh, there needs to be in this land plan ways to allow uh, the neighborhood of West Tampa, uh, North Hyde Park, the connectivity to the, uh, uh, the heights and to the downtown to work more easily. And finally, uh, we've talked about uh, the importance of using the waterfront as an asset and a contributor to the creating the great place. Uh, within two years, hopefully, you're going to have two sites that are going to be available or some form of disposition. Uh, the uh, North Boulevard public housing site, uh, which is going to need to be uh, uh, looked at in the context of those tenants that don't want to relocate, as well as the tenants that do, and then the city's wastewater vehicle uh, parking area. The choices that you make on how these near-term sites develop are going to be critical, because in, my, in this business, well begun is halfway finished. And so to the extent that you start right with these near-term opportunities, what's going to happen is the rest, of the, prop, the rest of the development opportunities are going to proceed from this good start. And then you're also going to have other opportunities that are going to be available within the next five years, the privately owned multifamily sites and the reconfigured uh, uh, city recreation area and the school district ball fields. Uh, so that, uh, and that's going to require discussion with the school district and the city on issues such as liability and uh, access by the public. So those are going to be available within the next five years. Uh, I talked I talk about catalytic users, uses. Chris talked about the importance of, of density as a catalytic a, a catalyst for scale and for services and for the kinds of. Uh, uh, and for creating a place where people want to live. Mixed use, mixed income, uh, grocery, pharmacy, the city rec center, all of, all of these activating the waterfront. This is an example of a project that I think is, there, there's a lot of good ideas that you can steal shamelessly from this project. Uh, this is uh, uh, the villages at East Lake, uh, which is a partnership, public-private partnership between Atlantic Housing Authority and Cousins Property. Who knows about this project? Yeah, I mean, here's the catalyst here was a championship golf course at a charter school. And, and, and the community basically has changed the character of this community to the point that we tore down hell and built heaven. And, and that's exhibited by the uh, past president of the East Meadows Resident Association. So take a look at examples like that around the country of the ways in which change has been catalyzed to create great places. The capital needs of this area are going to be numerous, and I, I did want to, you know, again, on that list of six things that you need to finish in the next two years, understanding how much money you're going to need uh, to uh, proceed effectively with implementation is definitely one of them. It's clear that the market 
today is not as strong as it was five years ago. And so, uh, and the market in that area, given the fact that uh, uh, right now, uh, if you said uh, to people, well, I've got a great condominium in, uh, uh, on North Boulevard uh, near the high school, I, I'm sure that you wouldn't get a, a huge market price for that. And so there's going to be a need for public-private partnerships to leverage uh, private investment using public dollars. And hopefully you put those public dollars into projects in a way in which, as the developer succeeds, you take a promotional interest and get paid, ba paid, paid back as, at, a, at a subordinated promotional interest so that the gap financing essentially uh, is not permanently uh, locked in to the project. You've also got the infrastructure and transportation, the relocation of the wastewater vehicle yards and, and ball fields. You may have to advance monies to those and get repaid back out of redevelopment at a future tax increment. Uh, renewal of the recreation center and the riverfront enhancement. The, the, the management of the timing of those expenditures and the availability of tax increment funding is going to be a major part of your implementation plan. Um, I've done a lot of workforces is really an important part of your strategy. So let me turn it over at this point to the other member of the Oakland, California Mafia, <laughs> Elisa uh, Gallo, who is the Economic Development Manager for the City of Oakland. So let's just do some concluding thoughts and capture some of the high points of this presentation. So first of all, we salute uh, Mayor Buckhorn and um, his team and really encourage you to look at uh, this area as an opportunity for change, as an area to be, uh, to build your city, as an area to attract uh, not only your local and your regional, and, and it was mentioned, a national uh, development opportunity. And we always would like to encourage you to be bold in that. It will take patience, it will take organization, it will take creativity and financing, but you certainly have a good start if you know that it is a long-term vision. So we, we really encourage you to focus on the water. Uh, we encourage you to begin some short-term actions, particularly in transportation services. It definitely should be a city-led effort, but there needs to be a partnership with your uh, partners in the area that have been mentioned today, particularly your governmental agencies. And it, of course, it's very important that this land use plan be a component of the major uh, greater downtown master plan effort that's going on. We also said go beyond the red line, meaning look at the broader context of where this area adds value uh, to the city as well as the region. And there might be an opportunity if, if, it, there, if it's not too late, if it's not set in stone yet, to look at your CIP plan to see if that's an opportunity for funding um, the larger effort or adding to it. So again, we, uh, we encourage you to look at uh, beginning the process to look at forming the CRA district. We uh, encourage, because of the need to create identity, to create, to begin to identify this area as an area of importance that you begin to look at ways, and this is a community effort, to brand and to uh, bring market to this place. We have some short-term and, and some immediate measures that we would highly encourage that we believe uh, can be beneficial to your local residential community there. They deserve to be safe. Uh, consider what are short-term opportunities, again, that your partners might also engage in. And then later, as you develop your new design, whatever your land use plan turns out to be, you can encourage uh, greater safety through new design um, mechanisms. Uh, certainly, any community, any neighborhood needs to be completed by commercial opportunities and job creation. Um, and you have some great starter points with some of the facilities and universities that you have in this area. And then we believe that uh, the housing authority uh, should begin to lead the effort to look at the initial preliminary planning that's going to be necessary for the uh, relocation plan because we understand that's a process that involves uh, information education of, of the affected 
individuals as well as a financing program that has to come in place. And you're very good at it, so I, we don't need to tell you how to do it. It's just it may be good to start thinking that through. And certainly, you are very lucky to have some key educational institutions uh, here that are not only offer the opportunity to build the community, to build for your children, as, as Mayor Buckhorn said, but the University of Tampa, we believe, is a, a very strategic partner to begin to look at not only the ability for educational improvement, but also the ability to bring the Central Business District over into this area and offer employment opportunities, workforce housing opportunities, and as well as some of the uh, other economic development features like jobs and, and retail as well. So I'm going to turn over your homework assignment to Hillary. So I was a teacher only for one year, so it, it's like old times trying to give out homework. Um, what I wanted to say is, uh, in closing, is just a little bit about phasing. You have a great site here, um, and I think you've had a lot of planning initiatives that have gone in the past, and really what's going to be the success of this is both the vision and the phasing and the ability to get something done quickly and make it, people believe that it's going to happen. So it's, well, it's be bold, it's also get it done kind of thing. And, you know, in our experience, you have to get something started pretty quickly or people start to become a little bit jaded and start to think that, uh, is this one not going to happen too? I mean, I think you have great leadership with the mayor and all his folks, and I think this is the time. So let's capture the energy and really make it happen. Um, I don't think that these are unexpected because I think we've reiterated them before and before, but I'll just go quickly through them. Um, we, we believe the mayor should appoint a steering committee to lead the study uh, study area planning process, um, negotiate a planning agreement with the p key public agencies. Um, I know that everybody has met together. I think it's, it's the chance to actually really formalize that agreement and an understanding of going forward. Um, start forming the CRA district. We've talked about um, uh, the redevelopment and relocation plan lastly. And then I, I can't stress enough in the phasing efforts that some of the early programming opportunities and funding sources for the for the park. I think that um, getting people to the site, getting to start to see the change, you know, um, that's going to really make a huge difference in getting in getting the momentum going forward. So we are meeting again in April. You have a little bit of time, but you can't make Kathy do everything. So uh, you know. <laughs> So get to work, and, and we'll, we'll see you soon. And just in closing, there have been a lot of people that we have worked with, and uh, we would like to thank them all. I'm not going to read the names, but you can see that when we come and when we meet, the, the output of this process is only as good as the input we get from everybody, and it really takes more than one person. You can see by this list that we, we thank you all for your help with us, and we've really enjoyed our stay in Tampa. So thank you.